we often think of James Madison as the father of our Constitution, but there was another gentleman that was the primary writer of that preamble, is that correct? His name was Gouverneur Morris. He was given the a wordsmithing of this document. So he has an interesting, my understanding is from the Huguenot tradition, but when you go inside of the Constitution Center, you'll see this big hulking figure bending over Benjamin Franklin who's seated. And if you look carefully, you'll notice he has a peg leg. And you think, wow, that man must have been a war hero, but that's not well, the no. case. Well, <laughs> no, that was an accident out of a window, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> he, according to the story, he broke his leg jumping out of a window where some place he shouldn't have, should have been. <laughs> and uh, it cost him an amputation. Well, we're back to uh, total depravity Total again. depravity <laughs> shows itself. So none, none of our founders were perfect. Well now, well, now that you mentioned that, in this Constitution Center, there's an amazing room in there with many life-size life size bronze statues of many of our founders. Describe some of the ones, well, you mentioned Gouverneur Morris is there, Franklin is there. Okay, well, so we start with Franklin who's seated, too old to stand. We have Gouverneur Morris looking over his shoulder. There presiding is George Washington, the one who called for this meeting, but didn't know they would fully rewrite the Constitution, but he presides. You have James Madison, the architect, and not far from Madison, you have an interesting person there who is uh, someone we ought to know more about because this particular individual signed all of the founding documents of America. He signed the Articles of Confederation. He signed the Declaration of Independence. He signed uh, the Constitution. I think he also signed the Northwest Ordinance. Do you know who I'm talking about? Roger Sherman? That's it. Roger Sherman. From Connecticut. Connecticut. And what's interesting about Roger Sherman he was an elder in his church, and he wrote the Constitution for his church. It's a statement of faith, which is fully Calvinistic and Reformed. How about this? He, was, he would have been really happy to say a couple of Presbyterians talking about That's it. That's right. Not far from uh, Roger Sherman is another person who's now very famous because of a Broadway musical. And we know his name is Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton has been well represented by the hip hop smash play. I, I didn't recommend know he could it. Sing, did <laughs> I didn't know it. I, I got that as a Christmas gift from one of my daughters, and I got to see the original cast. And I was stunned at how much historical accuracy comes through the rhyme and rhythm. But what's interesting is that you'll remember that all of the the states were represented, and the three people from New York of which Hamilton was one at the Constitutional Convention, uh, were there and two of them left and went home and they were not happy with the proceedings. So Hamilton was left, but he did not have a voice because you had to have a majority of your represent. So he's standing there, but he can't do anything. He can't do anything with this. Oh. But what is amazing is this man that couldn't do anything because of the leaving, he becomes the man that writes the most potent defense of it in the Federalist Papers. Now those are pseudonyms under their names, but Hamilton wrote most of the key uh, arguments that become part of that classic document of the Federalist Papers. And by the way, when you read the Federalist Papers, you say, wow, these men were really intelligent. Look at their vocabulary and their reasoning. And we forget they were written so the common farmer would understand why we would have a need for the Constitution, which I think we've been dumbed down a little bit in our education. A little bit, the perhaps. level of uh reading ability amongst even a farmer yeah. uh, who perhaps never went to school. That's right. Could understand what, what so, they were writing. So in there, there are three special people in the back that we often should think about who are the people that didn't sign. They were framers but chose not to sign. And they're called the dissenters. George Mason is one of those for whom George Mason is a uh, college or university is named. Why didn't he sign? because he said, you don't have enough protection for the individual. Thank God for him. He was one of the ones that said, you need a Bill of Rights. There had been a Bill of Rights in the history of England. We said, we need one in America. He said, our constitution, with all of its power structure, could begin to erode the rights of individuals. That was a strategic thing. Another one there is a man by the name of Eldridge Gary. Most people forget about Eldridge Gary until you say the word, gerrymandering. And you say, well, yeah, isn't that redistricting with the, the shenanigans of Congress trying to get more votes in different districts? That's exactly right. Uh, Gary, his name becomes Jerry in this word, had 
redistrict once he was in politics some of the areas so there'd be more votes for his party. And when people looked at the map, they say, it looks like a salamander. That's how strangely it was shaped. And so the word gerrymander was created for one of the dissenters. But that was very late in his career. Up to that point, yeah. uh, Elder Gary is one of the uh, characters that we should really be paying uh, significant attention to. Well, that's the point. There's uh, pluses and minus in every one of our leaders. And of course, that's a biblical truth too. That's right. When you look at the great leaders of the, of the biblical history, they all failed in some way. Every one of them, except Jesus Christ. Well, when uh, I walk through this uh, Constitution Center, one of the things that I always end up in front of is this magnificent wooden eagle. And it's beautifully done, but what's most interesting is where it comes from. Tell us about that eagle and, and where it comes from. Well, one of the great stories of the Providence Forum, the ministry that helps to create even what we're doing here, was that we realized from time to time we would be able to put on conferences, write books, have speeches, but maybe create historic artifacts. We didn't know how that would all come about, but when that discovery that 2001 was gonna be the 300th anniversary of William Penn's Charter of Privileges, we said we need to make a new Liberty Bell because that's what it was celebrating in the first instance with the Jubilee text. One that actually rings. The one that <laughs> rings and maybe we could let it travel like the abolitionists did with the old bill. Right. And so we had that built uh, at the Whitechapel Foundry in London. It arrived on exactly in time for the 300th anniversary ah, to the day. Great. It was at the big celebration. But before it came, I began to scratch my head and said, when it gets here, it needs to be put together. We need to have some wood at the top that we call that the yoke of the bell, the wood right. that it hangs on. And I thought, I wonder if there's some historic wood that could be used. I didn't, I didn't know where to look, I didn't have any idea. And believe me, out of the blue, I got a call from a young man in Maryland who said, I have the wood of the last Liberty tree and I'm trying to find friends to help me. The Liberty tree, what is a Liberty okay, tree? Okay, now that's an interesting story. That's what I said to, Mar to this young man, I said, that's great, I know you're excited, but what's a liberty tree? I didn't know. And he proceeded to tell me that in 1765, when the Stamp Act was established, they gathered on the Boston Common and declared themselves to be the Sons of Liberty protesting, and they called this big tree their liberty tree. And from it, they hung some of the leaders in effigy, saying they're taking away our constitutional rights and therefore our money illegally, and we're going to stand against it. Well, that created this new movement called the Sons of Liberty and the Liberty Tree. And that image over the years to come spread from place to place. So we there were a lot of Liberty there Trees. There were a lot of Liberty Trees across the colonies. We can have stories of them in different places. Uh, maybe you've heard of Pole Tavern, New Jersey. It used to be called Liberty Pole Tavern because Liberty Poles and Liberty Trees are closely connected, uh -huh. okay? Now I'll tell that story this way, that basically the Liberty Tree circulated and the last one that was standing was on the St. John's College campus in Annapolis, Maryland. Under that perhaps 800 year old tree, the Sons of Liberty gathered together and they read the Declaration of Independence. All the other trees that were historic had died. This was the last one. In 1999, Hurricane Floyd blew it down oh. and it was thrown into a landfill and a young man rescued it. So he had the wood. He had the wood and he called me up. And when he told me what it was, I said, is there enough to make a yoke on a bell? He said, yes, there's lots more. Well, lo and behold, by the Lord's providence, the providence form ended up with much of that wood. And we had one piece that was very large and one of America's premier woodworkers had seen it. So that eagle is carved out of Liberty Tree wood. It is indeed. And so when you see this beautiful eagle, that's a year's worth of work by Gene Landon, one of America's premier woodworkers. He worked for the Smithsonian, Winter Tour, all sorts of places. And he said, it'll take me a year to do it, but I'll do it. So we were able to raise the money for that, to have it done. And we it's put it on permanent loan here in wow. a beautiful case. So where's the bell? Well, the bell, after it circulated the country, FedEx was taking it all over the country <laughs> for us. It made it to the Super Bowl, the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, it made it out it. to Marsh Air Force Base and it rang as soldiers were being sent off to uh, the Middle East to stand for freedom. 
And finally, we said it needs a home. And as they were just moving in the American Bible Society here, I met some people there that were helping to establish the Bible Museum in Washington. In Washington, D.C. And they said, uh, well, it's nice to meet you. Tell me about your work. And I said, well, you know, we're, we're doing this history work and we have this big Liberty Bell replica we're looking for home. He goes, what? I said, yeah. I said, we just had a meeting and we want to do this floor at the Bible Museum. We'll talk about the Bible's impact on America. And we've envisioned that right at the heart of it would be a Liberty Bell because it has a Bible verse on so it. So that's where Providence Forum's bell was. And then I said, guess wow. what? We're looking for one. Would you like to have it? They said, it's a deal. That's fantastic. And so you can find online the story of artifact number one going into the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C. A big crane is letting it down through the top. Too heavy to go through the service elevator. So it's exhibit number one. And when I go there, I always say, this is our bell. And we've given it permanently to them. Now, in addition to that, I don't know much about horticulture, but my understanding is is that you can take uh, materials from an old plant, old tree, and actually create the grandbabies of that tree. So we've actually had uh, help in uh, creating the grandbabies of the Liberty Tree. That is exactly and you're right. Planting, we've been planting them around different places in the country. Yes, that technique is called bud grafting. And there's a friend of uh, the Providence Forum from the DuPont family. He likes to say, I'm the part of the family with the name, but not the money, but I have good connections. And he said, Mount Cuba, the DuPont horticultural that knows how to bud graft. He said, I bet we can bud graft some of the seedlings that grew from this last Liberty Tree. And so we have now been able to bud graft them and they've been planted for example, I think in every county in the state of Missouri by the 4-H club How about that? celebrating post-traumatic stress syndrome soldiers. But we have one of those literal uh, trees from seeds from the last tree here at the right National here, Constitution, Constitution Center. Center. So when you look at the eagle on this one side and you look out through the glass, you see the tree. So this is the parent, this is the child. This is the eagle of freedom, and that's a liberty tree that's carrying on the legacy alive for the next generation. And so the bell in Washington, D.C., made in the Whitechapel foundry to commemorate uh, Penn's charter privileges as liberty tree wood in its yoke. So that liberty tree wood is getting around, and there's still pieces of it. In different we made a Bible box, and we gave it to George W. Bush when he came to town some years ago when he was president. Well, William Penn's vision of religious freedom is enshrined in our Constitution in the First Amendment, where it describes how the federal government will not establish any particular faith tradition uh, as, a, as the national church, but at the same time makes it very clear that the that government will also not prohibit the free exercise of religion. So for our purposes in this Faith and Freedom Tour, that's a very, very important part of the Constitution, but it goes all the way back to William Penn. And in our next session, that is going to be our topic. We're going to take a look at the work and the life of William Penn and how his legacy and the principles of religious freedom has continued all through the few hundred years of America's existence. So we invite you to join us next time. And thank you so much for joining us for this session. God bless you. Shalom.